Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMY ZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated, her websites JugglingDynamite.com and VenablePark.com. Welcome back to the show, Danielle. Thank you, Jim. Danielle, the U.S. debt ceiling, the deadline, Janet Yellen says they're out of money June 1st. Uh, how serious is that? It Does it affect Canada in, in any way? Or if there's a crash in the U.S. or the government doesn't have money, I guess that affects the whole world. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this is mostly theater. They've already spent this money. It's not like new spending. They've already spent it. So now they have to increase the line of credit, so to speak, to fit on the money they've already agreed to spend. So it's kind of nonsense what happens. But the thing I think that's more relevant is that this standoff is not likely to help in terms of expanding any fiscal uh, assistance to the economy, and that could be significant in a negative way because, you know, we're already staring at the um, gl- a global recession basically starting any time here, and we've got a massive monetary contraction in terms of liquidity in the world and the world banking system. So to have, you know, uh, fiscal constraints continue here, um, and, you know, again, we're coming into the final year of the U.S. presidential election, um, and typically all of those factors, when you have a standoff between the two parties and, you know, no one wanting to help Biden in terms of stimulus, stimulus right now, uh, because they would, you know, the Republicans want to take back the, the government in the next election. So there's this standoff going on all over the place. And I think that that is really sort of, um, you know, compounding the challenges for the economy in the United States and in Canada and really by, by um, you know, impact all over the world. Now, how solid are Canadian banks? We're hearing a fourth U.S. bank is uh, very wobbly again because uh, the Fed just hiked interest rates again. Yeah, so, well, what's going on there is, um, uh, you know, it's primarily the regional banks. We've talked about this before, Mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, the three of the four largest U.S. bank failures uh, in history have happened since March, so it's quite a stat. But if you look at the actual, um, the 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 dollar amounts that are involved, the assets on the bank balance sheets at the time they've come into these crises has been 10 times what it was, you know, 10 years ago before all the QE started. So really this has the hallmark or the footprint of the QE policies that central banks around the world implemented after the 2010 uh, downturn that began in the economy. It was so quickly quick that the economy sort of weakened again after the 2008 recession that they started pulling out, you know, they were already at 0.25 in terms of interest rates and they decided they would pump a lot more liquidity in this experiment they called quantitative easing, brainchild of uh, Ben Bernanke at the time. And what happened was they, you know, they did flood the banking system and all these excess deposits and productivity suffered because there wasn't enough spots to put this capital in a productive way in the economy. And then, of course, with the COVID fiscal stimulus on top of more and more um, liquidity pumping, we got that boost in um, in inflation. And now, um, you know, central banks have been focused almost 
solely on the concern about inflation, um, which is a lagging indicator, as we've discussed many times. And so now we've had a massive um, downturn in the rate of inflation. You know, it peaked last June. The U.S. inflation was north of 9% last June. And in the latest reading, it's back to 5%. So really, inflation is last year's story. And yet the central bank, um, the U.S. Fed this week, um, you know, Ben, uh, sorry, uh, Jerome Powell, uh, indicated that you know they did hike again, 0.25. The ECB hiked this week as well. But the thing is, these guys are notoriously horrible at um, seeing any kind of a downturn coming in terms of uh, contraction in the economy. So they always hike into these recessions beginning. That's the classic pattern. They did it in 2008. Uh, they didn't see that train coming, the Great Recession, and they, uh, you know, so so this is very typical. Um, and then they make these outrageous statements, like you know uh, Janet Yellen saying uh, when she was in the Fed chair that she didn't think there'd be another financial crisis in her lifetime. And you think to yourself, why would any rational human say such a ridiculous comment when we have such a history of these things happening, especially when you've got record amounts of debt in the world? And then yes, this week. Um, Powell, Chair Powell, the U.S. Fed, said that he, he continues to think it's possible that this time really is different and avoiding a recession is, my view, more likely than having a recession. Well, this, at a time when all of the leading indicators that give us and some of the coincident indicators are now suggesting a recession is 99.9% lock, starting, yeah. if not in June, then July, so again, the credibility is really rough, um, and and yet the media spends all its day parsing the phrases and speaking with precision about you know whether there's a the here and a but there. It's just nonsense. Economy's in a major downturn. Monetary contraction has never been this large in the history of humanity. They they left rates at zero for too long. They allowed the banks to get fat and lazy, making profits off people's deposits where they weren't paying anything out and they were able to, you know, put it into longer duration assets. And then they went and abruptly shifted the, the monetary policy to, the, you know, the, the greatest rate of change in the history of humanity. And what happened? Uh, people finally figured out that they could take money out of their bank account and actually buy things that were, you know, relatively low risk and still yielding above 4%, near 5%. Uh, and the central banks did nothing to help that this week as they hiked rates further. So now the overnight base rate in the U.S. is 5 to 5 and a quarter. Um, and the ECB is, you know, 3.75, 3. and they're thinking they're going to hike more. This is all kind of nonsense because the fact of the matter is that as soon as we get into a job loss spike, which is the final, you know, lagging indicator of the economic contraction, don't forget that the central bank has a duty to uh, a mandate of not only protecting uh, against for price stability, but also for trying to maintain employment. So when we get this tick up in unemployment, which has been coming in all the leading indicators of shorter job week, uh, shorter work weeks, and less temp help being hired, and a bunch of um, an, a bunch of layoffs have already been happening year to date. So as soon as we start to see a uh, pick up in unemployment, you're going to have you know very likely a abrupt reversal again in central bank policy. But the problem is, as we've spoken before, Jim, that it, whatever they do, whether it's tightening or loosening, we're talking about a year to two lag time for it to hit the economy. And so that means that what they did in 2022, the, the abrupt uh, increase in rates over the last year to the highest uh, level in, since 2007, uh, in a matter of months, which is unprecedented, um, you know, all of a sudden that is, is hitting the economy like a, like a train wreck right now and will do so for the next year or more, even if they go back to trying to ease monetary policy. So um, the strains in the banking system are really contagious right now, especially in the U.S. banks, because they, the regional banks in particular lobbied so hard to not be subject to the same capital requirements and ratios and regulations that the big banks did, you know, which was a mistake. Um, a lot of the, the European banks did not uh, loosen up the requirements or regulations on them, small to medium-sized banks. The, um, they maintained these uh, more stringent requirements, and their banks are relatively more stable right now. The same thing in Canada. We don't really have this rash of, you know, the regional banks uh, like they do in the United States, and so that's where... Um, 
people have been whipping the deposits out of there and they are now looking, oh dear, we have to raise cash. If we're going to raise cash, we have to sell some of these long duration assets that we've been holding that have gone down in price. So if we are forced to sell them, we're taking losses uh, and, and that's where they suddenly become insolvent. And you've got some of the those bank shares crashing, you know, 25 to 60% just in the past couple of days, like no bank can really withstand that kind of capital or, you know, capital contraction uh, without having solvency problems. So uh, I don't see it as the same a threat in the Canadian banking system, um, but certainly the American system is, is unraveling uh, at that level. And I think the solution is going to be, you know, takeovers by the larger banks. We're going to get even bigger and bigger banks, um, less of the small to medium size. The problem is they're the main lenders to the general economy. So, you know, small businesses are the bulk of the economic output. They're the bulk of the employment that goes on in the country. And right now, they're not getting loans, right? They were, in, in this last decade, the main lenders to the private sector, to startups, to all the small businesses that do all the heavy lifting in the economy was coming from these regional banks. So the fact that they are now all in uh, various states of capital disarray and not able to make uh, loans is a, again, very negative impact for the economy. So I think all of that is just making it worse. Um, the hangover from the party of the low for long, you know, decade that we had in rates. But I think the important thing to remember here is again back to this po- this concept of the lags. Um, you know, people were parsing uh, Jerome Powell's language this week to say, "Hey, he's hinting that potentially this could be the last hike." Um, He didn't come out and say that, but he sort of left room for the potential that this could be the last hike. So if we look at historically, from that date of pause to the stock market low, it's quite illuminating. So in the in the 2000 and um, 2000 cycle, the Fed paused in May of 2000. Our recession began. within the year, by March of 2001, it was the start of the official recession, and the Fed began to cut rates in January 2001. But there was ultimately a 42% loss in the overall stock market over the 29-month period from that pause in May of 2000 to uh, when the market finally bottomed in October of 2002. If you look at the cycle after that, and again, the, the Fed paused in July of 2006, it took 33 months for the stock market to make its ultimate low in March of 2009, and it was a 55% drop from the time they paused to the ultimate market low. Um, the similar thing you know, happened in, in the 81 cycle and in the, uh, the 73, uh, 73, July of 73 pause, and the market didn't ultimately bottom until October of 74. So you get these you know, misconceptions that if the central bank decides to uh, ease or or just pause or ease that all things are solved. And that is the farthest thing from the truth. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, we talk about the Fed being incredibly slow to realize there are problems. Well, for two years, there was inflation that they called transitory, temporary. Uh, Of course, it didn't go away and they didn't do anything to, to help it go away at the time. And, of course, we've heard from people who say, well, central banks should be abolished. They can't deal with stuff. Is there a solution? Or, look, we just have to live with the fact there are cycles and uh, there are good ones and bad ones. Yeah, no, I think we need to have central banks. Uh, We need to have lenders of last resort. Um, Traditionally, before we had any kind of that uh, institution providing that kind of function. It was a very, we had a lot of depressions. We had a lot of uh, failures, um, financial crisis. That was all very common. What happened in the last 20 years is that the central bank gave up, the central banks gave up their mandate of being lenders of last resort, which means they are supposed to backstop uh, banking institutions, regulate institutions and backstop them to help them not lose uh, deposits. So not go bankrupt and take down deposits. 
and if they get into trouble, they're to be lent funds, but at a high interest rate so that they have an incentive to avoid needing to get into those scenarios. What we did wrong the last 20 years is that every time the banking, uh, the major banks got into an over-leveraged position, we gave them money for free. And that is what's haunting us right now today. That's why they were able to make uh, very big profits during the period of QE when rates were nothing and they were able to gamble with our deposits, uh, paying nothing to, to the owners of the funds and using the money to lever up their profits. So all that went on. Um, and then now, of course, the opposite, you know, as deposits are leaving in self-interest of trying to find some yields, which it can, which, you know, we savers can finally pick up yields. Um, the, the overnight, um, bank rate is now yielding more than corporate debt is, than you can get on junkier, uh, high risk corporate debt. So who in their right mind would continue to hold, you know, higher risk instruments, equities, dividend paying things and all that stuff, which during the period of ZERP, everyone felt they had no alternative. They had to go into this risky stuff. Well, now they don't because we have these, uh, you know, uh, the, sh- the most sort of what's no- known as the risk-free rate um, is highest in 15 years and higher yielding than these risky securities. So, um We definitely need to have some structure, some regulations, some oversight. We definitely need to have a base rate, a risk-free rate set in the banking system. The major mistake, in my view, was allowing it to go to zero. Like, that is such a artificial and, um, you know, unhealthy um, system. That is not – we had, had, you know, all this uh, trillions of dollars of of negative-yielding debt in the world during that period, which made no sense whatsoever, Jim, of course, that borrowers would be paid to borrow money. What? Like, we lived through such madness. And, it, you know, we're like frogs in a pot when it gets so crazy. It, you, you hardly even, you know, you think it must be you at some point. Oh, well, maybe I'm just misunderstanding. And, of course, that's what the financial world is constantly telling us about how smart they are and how dumb we are. So, anyway, the, the bottom line is that all of this stuff is just kind of correcting for the madness that was. Um, a recession is a natural and recurring part of the business cycle. The good news is that we currently have... Uh, yield, again, compensation to savers, which is awesome. The mistake most people are making is they're continuing to hold risky assets in this environment, thinking that it's something like 2020, where, you know, we had a big collapse uh, at the start of the pandemic and then a sharp V recovery because they were able to slash rates and uh, pump liquidity into financial markets. And, you know, that really stalled and stopped the bear market from continuing in its normal uh, cleansing path. But Here we are. It's been two years now of falling markets. This is a good old-fashioned bear market, as I've explained before. We're not through it yet. Historically, we could expect to see the asset prices continue to fall, the risky stuff, over the next year, and that would be highly usual, normal. Um, And the highly levered will be taken off in stretchers, and that's highly the way it's supposed to be. Uh, Those that have cash... Uh, will be receiving compensation as they wait to buy things on clearance, which is awesome. Um, and also, the you know, during this period, the government bonds, the treasuries, um, the highest sec- security credits are actually attracting great inflows all over the world. Um, and our bond portfolio has been getting a nice bump in the last couple of months, and that should continue. Typically, that is what happens during the recession once it, begin- it, it starts and stocks then have to reprice the reality of a contraction in the earnings um, of corporate of companies by up to 20% more is a typical drawdown in earnings reported during a recession. Um, the stock market has not priced for that at all. There's still this belief that somehow central banks are going to save us all or that somehow we're going to get a recession without an earnings recession, that corporations will somehow continue to you know, make off like bandits. Um, and we've got massive inventory all over the world. So the, we, have, you know, we had a bottleneck in supply that helped drive inflation. Now we have the opposite. We have excess capacity, excess inventory, and we're going to see a lot of stuff go on sale. So that's ultimately all very positive if you prepare for it. Danielle, anything else we should be a clo- keep a close eye on right now, or do you think we've pretty well covered it? Um, 
I mean, there's so many things to keep an eye on at the moment. But, you know, I think um, we've pretty much covered the main points, is that cycles are normal, recessions are part of it, um, the stock market never bottoms before a recession begins, the stock market never bottoms before central banks have been cutting rates for a period of time, not when they pause, not when they first cut, but, you know, after they've been cutting, and earnings bottom after that. So just understanding that that's the normal pattern of things will help you navigate yourself, I think, uh, in, a, in a better way than most. Danielle, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, thank you, Jim. My guest has been Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Her website's jugglingdynamite.com and venablepark.com. If you have any questions for Danielle or any of our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.